everyone. And welcome to worship with First Congregational Church of Concord, whether you are in room or on Zoom or joining us live on Facebook. We hope that this service provides a space of both comfort and challenge for you. Uh, we have a bunch of announcements, so settle in for a second. Um, the first, um, from actually a thank you from Brandy. We thank you for all of the responses that folks have sent in regarding her letter that was sent out. Um, thank you, thank you. If you haven't yet had a chance, we invite you to check in with Brandy. Um, and also continue, thank you for your continued patience as we create this shift and transition, um, having to learn from scratch um, all of the systems that we were using, that Carolyn was using so diligently, um, and creating new systems as well. So we thank you for your patience in that. Um, also, as you, you all in the room know, I don't know if everybody online knows, we have a, a tulip on the altar this morning to celebrate the birth of Sarah Slosky's granddaughter, Sophia Mary. So congratulations and welcome to her. Our get to know you question for this morning is, would you rather hike up a mountain or explore a cave and why? And I'll tell you my answer right now. Mine is to explore caves. I actually like hidden, small, dark places, which I know is not everybody's favorite. So we have our next Circle Discernment Gathering next Sunday from 9.30 to 10.15 before worship. And you can join us here in room, or you can also join us on Zoom. And as some of you may know, the Super Bowl is coming up, which means our Super Bowl Sunday special offering is also coming up. And as you'll note in uh, the announcements, I've invited um, uh, everyone to, rather than giving all of their coins, like physical coins, if you would do us a favor and take those to the bank and have them deposited into your account and then give whatever the amount is uh, to the Super Bowl gathering, that would be great so that our small counting team doesn't have to count all of the pennies. That would be really helpful. Uh, and again, all of that special offering is going to go to assist the Friendly Kitchens Ministry in food uh, insecurity in the Concord area. And uh, a couple others that aren't in the bulletin, but there's information about them out front on the bulletin board. The New Hampshire Conference's Prepared to Serve Day of Learning and Community is coming up. It's Saturday, Saturday, mm, Saturday February 25th. Um, and uh, the Jazz Sanctuary team, most of us will be there to either do, we're going to lead a workshop, we're going to have an exhibition table, um, and uh, there's a lot of other great workshops that you can go to. So if you've never been, if you've been before and haven't been in a while, I highly encourage you to sign up to go. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then also, the UCC New England Women's Celebration is happening shortly. I didn't write the date down on this one, but there's a flyer out there that lists all the workshops that are happening in that celebration. And this year it's happening in Manchester at the Radisson Hotel. And you don't have to stay at the hotel, you can just drive in for the, the two days of workshops if you're interested in that as well. And I invite you to read the other announcements during the sermon if you want, it's fine, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. But at some point, read the other announcements if you're interested. With all of that in mind, I invite us to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship as we listen to our praise. to set our intentions for worship, remembering that an intention is essentially a focus. So we invite you to choose a focus for worship.
now I would like to invite Annie to come and lead us in our opening words. Oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you and eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. Let us bring ourselves into God's presence. Steadfast God, when we feel overwhelmed, encourage us to take one step at a time and to remember we are never alone. Amen. And for our opening hymn this morning, we're going to sing uh, Lead Us From Death to Life. Um, Annie is going to play through the verse for us, and then we will all join together in beginning with the refrain. Here now, Psalm 57 
from the Reverend Benjamin Chavis Salter entitled, Come Into Wilmington, North Carolina. Hear us, O God, hearken to our desperate plea. Come into Wilmington, North Carolina. Let thy light shine on this repressive port city. Thy people here are in need, O God. We call out for thy aid. Get us together. Encourage thy people to organize for liberation. On the waterfront of the Cape Fear, help us to stand up for that which is right in thy sight. Years ago, we came to these same indelicate wooden docks on slave ships chained as property en route to the open air market. And today, O oh God, the shackles of poverty and injustice are wielded on my people with a phlegmatic steel of indifference. Some of us have given up. There is no hope left in their being. But thou, O oh God, art the greatest of hopes. Thou art our strength. Come into us and grant thy people an awakening. Come into Wilmington and let thy light shine on all thy creation. Here ends our reading. And here now from the Hebrew scriptures, from Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Here ends the lesson. And I invite Annie to come and share with us our gospel. Hear now from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. At about that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. So when the sun came up, it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Study the story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel. This is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there is no soil of character, and so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there's nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but weeds of worry and illusions about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard, and nothing comes of it. The seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news, and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Here ends the lesson. Amen. 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 Thank you, Annie. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The parable of the sower is one of Jesus's most well-known parables, and for good reason. Jesus was a masterful teacher, largely because he was so good at telling stories, 
in order to illustrate difficult teachings that help us to understand and remember those lessons. What makes the parable of the sower so unique is that it's the only illustrated story in the Gospels in which Jesus then breaks down the lesson, explaining it and the meaning of the metaphors. If only he did that for all of them. But there you are. Before we begin talking about seeds and soils, I want to bring attention to Matthew 13, verse 1, which gives us some interesting insight into what was happening prior to the telling of this parable. Jesus went to sit by the lake that was near a house he was staying in. As often happened, the second Jesus stepped out into public, a crowd gathered around him. This crowd was so large that he decided to get into a boat and sit it just offshore. Why? Well, because in a large crowd, only though standing on earth, only those standing closest to Jesus would have been able to hear him. But the lake acts as a natural amphitheater. His voice would have easily carried over the water to the entire crowd gathered on the beach. To me, that highlights just how important the message of this parable is. Jesus isn't just amplifying his voice for those people standing on the shore. He is also amplifying his voice 2,000 years into the future for us to hear once again. Additionally, it's important to remember that Jesus is speaking to an agricultural society. If you don't farm, you didn't eat. So the imagery in this parable of sowing seeds would have been very familiar to Jesus' audience. As always for Jesus, that's intentional. Jesus is using something they understand to explain to them something that was foreign. This parable starts with the farmer going out and spreading seed. The ancestors of the seeds that Genesis talks about at creation. And the rest of the parable talks about the soil in which the seed falls. The same soil that Genesis tells us God revealed from beneath the waves of the ocean. Now, even though we call this the parable of the sower, it's just as much a parable of the soil. The sower represents God. And the parable teaches us about ourselves, as it is we that Jesus is speaking of when referencing the soil. Similar to the picture on the cover of the bulletin this morning, when we hear Jesus speak about the farmer, the image we, that should be in our head is a farmer with a big satch, I mean, it's huge, of seeds. And the farmer is just reaching in double handfuls and scattering them out as far as they will go, throwing them on every inch of their land. The farmer is not worried about the kind of soil the seed will fall on. They are liberally spreading the seed. This is much different than how we farm today. In Jesus' day, you sowed and then you plowed. Thus, the harsh ground that chokes out life might become fertile. The farmer is sowing generously because they know that the more seed one sows, the bigger one's crop. Yes, the farmer will lose some of the seed, but the return is worth the cost. As we once again explore the parable of the sower, and as Jesus explains, remember that the seed represents the word of the kingdom. However, Jesus isn't referencing the Bible, nor is he referencing the four Gospels that were included in the Bible, both for the obvious reason that they didn't exist yet, and the fact that the word of the kingdom is so much more than what is printed in the 66 books of the Bible. Those 66 books point to the word of the kingdom. However, they are not even close to encompassing all that the word entails. Additionally, each of the four kinds of soil represent our hearts. But it is my belief that it's no coincidence that our hearts have four chambers, and there are four types of soil. As I share more about these four soils this morning, I invite you to ponder how much of each type of soil makes up your heart in this moment, rather than hoping against hope that all of our hearts are always and only made of soil that is good for growing? Because I know mine isn't. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, 
and the birds came and ate it up. This first soil shows how generously the farmer is, is sowing. God's throwing seeds even on beaten paths. The seeds cannot penetrate this compressed soil and end up being eaten by the birds. This soil represents the hardened places in our hearts, which are unable to listen to the word. Again, bigger, wider word, not just the books of the Bible. Those places simply reject it without taking the time to even consider how the word of the kingdom could impact our lives. Seeds cannot grow and bring life in hard pressed soil. Similarly, the word cannot take root in the hardened places in our hearts. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. They sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. When seed is planted in shallow soil, it will often start growing. That's why we do little seed planters to start before we put them in the deeper ground. But that life is short-lived. The soil is simply not deep enough to sustain life. There's not enough water for the plant so eventually the sun will scorch out all life. This seed represents the parts of our hearts, or I should say this soil, represents the parts of our hearts that are initially enthusiastic. However, their roots cannot go deep. Life happened, tragedy strikes, or busy work filled that space and faith faded. The word of the kingdom couldn't get below the surface and therefore cannot survive the trials and hardships of life. Plants need roots that will go deep to get water and nutrients to survive. Similarly, those seeking to live a life of faith, following the will of God, need deep roots that continually renew and refresh our faith. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. When you have fertile soil, it's not just the good seeds that will take root. Thorns will also try to take advantage of the soil. When that happens, the thorns will eventually choke out the good seeds. The young seeds can simply not survive the onslaught. This soil represents the part of our hearts that may look good on the outside, but have let sin or addiction creep in on the inside. In regards to this third type of soil, it isn't, or I should say, it is incorrect to picture little seeds being thrown into the middle of a full grown weed thorn patch. At the end of a farming season, the thorns, if there were any left after a dry, hot summer, would have been plowed under the soil after the harvest. So the image that Jesus is trying to convey is that good seed competing with bad seed is literally at the same time. In Luke's version of this story, the phrase that is used is to grow up together. So the seeds that the farmer sows in that soil and the roots and the seeds of the thorns, which are still underground, grow up together through the growing season. Still other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. When seeds find fertile soil, they will sprout to life and produce an abundant crop. In the parable of the sower, the yield is a hundredfold, which is an incredible amount. This number certainly would have grabbed the attention of Jesus's listeners getting such a big return in order to feed their families and to be able to pay the heavy taxes put on them by the Roman Empire was all that they wanted. This soil represents the part of our heart that hears the word of the kingdom with joy and eagerly seeks to deepen our connection with God and to be in service to God's vision and kingdom. The roots go deep in this soil and can sustain us through the hardships of life. This soil is primed and ready to grow. It allows us to do the work of spreading the kingdom message of love. As we ponder this parable once again, we need to take note that essentially all the soil is the same. It's the same soil since soil, as we heard in Genesis, was created. The difference between the soils are what's added to them and or how it's been cultivated or not. We are each the cultivators of our soil, our hearts. How we care for our hearts will determine the life that we grow. 
That should be both a challenge and an encouragement. If parts of our hearts are hard, or parts of them our faith is shallow, or if something is choking the life out of us, it's never too late to change. Because of the word of the kingdom and God's generosity, life can come from the dry, hard-pressed soil of those parts of our hearts and our lives. The parable of the sower is challenging us to cultivate our hearts. And it also gives a promise that if we cultivate our hearts, the life that God will bring in us <clears throat> and through us will be greater than we can possibly imagine. I also want to point out that even though this parable is more about the soil than about the seed, there is an incredible point that we shouldn't ignore about the farmer. In the parable of the sower, the farmer sows generously. God gives every kind of soil in our hearts a chance to produce life. The likelihood that seed will take root in so rocky soil is slim, but not impossible. What the parable of the sower teaches us is that God is generous. God extends grace to everyone and to every part of ourselves. Even to those places in us that God knows will likely reject the seed in a particular moment, the grace is given to those places anyway, in hopes that we will cultivate those places in our hearts and experience the life that God came to give. Again, I invite you to ponder which parts of your heart are currently more like the beaten path, perhaps places that you've walled off from God and others, or what places of your heart feel like rocky or shallow soil, where as much as you want to believe something is possible, there's just not enough room for that faith to deepen and to trust. Or perhaps, like me, you've been seeing how much thorny soil is in your heart and has been choking out the truth of God's love for you. And perhaps you're also seeing the parts of your heart that are filled with rich, hydrated, nutritious soil that is claiming the ways that God is moving in your life and allowing that gratitude to multiply a hundredfold, spilling out into the world that needs it so badly. In other words, we don't have to stay where we are internally, ever. Any heart can move from being, hypothetically, 10% fertile soil to, let's say, 99.9% .9 fertile soil because we're human, so there's that. Transforming from the hardest, most dense soil into fertile soil primed for life. Nope, it's not always easy. Maybe it's never easy. In fact, Jesus taught over and over again that we will need to release the burden of self and our addiction to following our self-will in order to find a true life in following the will of God. To close, I'm going to share words from therapist Alisa Yao from the blog, her blog called Urban Balance. Many of you have probably heard this story before, but I think it's very apt as we talk about the parable of the sower. She says, while in yoga class the other day, my teacher shared this Native American parable. An old Cherokee man is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you, too, and inside of every person. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee man simply replied, the one you feed. Whether or not it's your first time hearing this story, she says, it serves as an important reminder of the power we have over our experiences and our emotions. It's easy to feel like a victim in challenging situations and circumstances in our lives. We want to understand our negative thoughts, feelings, and experiences, so we place blame on other people, objects, or events. We look outward to try to make sense of what's going on inside 
of us. We do this all the time. Why? It's our way of coping and feeling more in control of uncontrollable situations. The problem with this approach, however, is that it takes away our personal responsibility and our freedom of choice. In our attempt to feel more in control by faulting others for our experience, we actually strip ourselves of our own power. That power is lost the moment we become dependent on other people or things to make us feel a certain way. Whether that feeling is positive or negative, we are no longer taking sole responsibility for our own emotions or experiences when we believe that they are a result of anything other than our own choice. By exercising your freedom of choice, you can make a life-changing decision of which wolf you want to feed. Do you feed the wolf who is hungry for anger, envy, sorrow, regret, and etc.? This wolf is also your inner critic, the one who tells you you are a failure, the one who says that no one will love you and or understand you for who you are. This wolf is a representation of your depression, your anxiety, and or your low self-esteem. Do you want to feed this wolf? Are you already feeding this wolf? By cutting off that wolf's supply, you will be making a choice to use your energy and resources on thoughts, feelings, and emotions that serve you in healthy ways. While you can recognize the negative emotions occurring within you, you don't have to attach to them or continue to give them attention. Shifting your focus is a sign that that wolf, to that wolf, that you're not interested in giving him any food. And while it may take some time for that wolf to lose strength and power, eventually he will surrender, as will your unhelpful thoughts and emotions. Once you stop fixating on them, they will eventually drift away. So what about the other wolf? Well, it certainly isn't going to feed itself. Just as you would feed the other wolf, it is imperative that you ex exercise your freedom of choice and decide to nourish the wolf of joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, etc. We often look to external objects for our fulfillment and happiness. We develop expectations that these things, like a new job, a relationship, a lavish vacation, a new pair of shoes, a glass of wine, etc., will finally make us feel the way we want to feel. And while this may bring momentary gratification, it isn't realistic to maintain this long term. Happiness, she concludes, isn't a conditional state. It's a state of being. True lasting happiness comes from making an active choice to be happy, rather than depending on external things to make you happy. The more that we seek out happiness and look for it as if it is a treasure we will find, like a pearl in a field, the less we are feeding the other wolf that is inside of us. You already have everything you need to be happy because you are whole as you are right now. The feeling and experience of happiness comes from feeding that wolf from within. As he becomes bigger and stronger, he will better be equipped to handle life's challenges. If you choose to feed only him, he will always win. We will now pause for a moment of silent reflection. I 
And now I invite you to join with me in singing hymn 318, Almighty God, your word is cast. <laughs> of partners and projects in India. In their own ways, all these institutions strive to follow the meaning and demand of the Beatitudes in many different areas of societal life and with varying modes of involvement. Poverty alleviation through direct help, providing immediate relief during natural disasters and other emergencies, to jobs training and income generating ventures, is one set of interventions attempted by a few of our partners. Attending to the healthcare needs in the remotest places in India is the vocation of many of our partners. And most of these hospitals are reputed institutions in their respective states in India. A significant number of our partners are engaged in overseeing formal education institutions of various levels. And many of them provide residential programs for students as a secure vehicle to equip them to break the cycles of oppression. Since Dalit, tribal, and women's exclusions and exploitations are entrenched in the social fabric of India, most of our partners are conscious of the situation and do strive to evolve programs and interventions with that awareness in mind and with a resolve to envision and realize a more equitable and just society. The educational scholarships enable many students from historically disadvantaged communities to pursue different tracks of higher education. It is a hope and desire that the scholarship recipients would emerge as organic intellectuals and leaders of respective communities and Indian society in general and give leadership to future rounds of transformations that any society would need to remain livable with plenty of equal opportunities, vibrant and forward looking. Along with the direct involvement of the lives of individuals and communities, a few of our partners contemplate and work on the questions of democracy, freedoms, rights, inter-religious understanding, and growing inequality. The international seminar organized by the Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society, ent entitled Dalit's Religion and Liberation, from January 5 through 7 of this year, like this month, at Bangalore began the process of critical examination of Dalit's theology's emergence and evolution through the last 40 years. And Global Ministries has been honored and humbled to be a partner in this major conversation. Let us pray together our prayers with India. 
God of all blessings, we thank you for the awareness of our blessedness. We thank you for teaching us with today's words on Beatitudes that pleasing human conduct is and what it means to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. We are grateful that it is not a simple and unthinking application of a rule, but one that would always require a due measure of fear and trembling in discerning what is just, in knowing how to do justice, to love kindness, and what it means to walk humbly with you, our God. Forgive us for not being diligent in addressing situations that are not just and kind. Strengthen us to be courageous, to venture beyond our discomfort, in striving for the blessedness of justice, peace, and love. We especially lift up every single person in India who struggle to behold and enshrine the values of your kingdom. Keep them and bless them, so that their labors may not be in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now I invite us to turn our hearts to the prayers that we've brought us with us this morning. I will invite us into a moment of silence to settle again into what God is saying to each of us. And then I invite us to lift up our prayers of joys and our prayers of concerns, either aloud, if you are comfortable, or in your hearts. And after each prayer spoken aloud, I will respond, God of dirt and seeds. And I invite you to join with me in responding, receive our prayers. So let us begin by tapping into our hearts and cultivating them in this moment. God of dry land and seeds, of seas and fruit trees, we ask that you hear now the prayers that we have brought with us this morning. Prayers of gratitude for our friend Ed's continued recovery that he was able to perform last night. God of dirt and seeds, receive our prayers. prayers. Prayers of thankfulness for those who've gone before us, willing to be open, to receive and to be with one another in grace. God of dirt and seeds, receive, receive our, our prayers. Prayers for everyone who has died by a violent act in the past week, both in our country and around the world. Prayers also for their families and loved ones. God of dirt and seeds, receive, receive our, our prayers. prayers. For all the blessings of this life, we give thanks to you, Creator God, for families, friends, colleagues, neighbors, and strangers who nurture us that the love of God may grow within, that your love, your word, like a seed, may grow to produce in us good fruit. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For the leaders of various nations and cities, so that they may lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy, with grace and wisdom. May they reflect your will guiding all their actions and decisions. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who serve in harm's way, those who live 
in dangerous places, those who live in areas of war or strife, those who live in fear, those who worry about employment, bills, food, and struggle just to find dignity in life. May your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. And may your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. For those who suffer from any illness or dis-ease of mind, body, or spirit, restore these and all we carry in our hearts to fullness of health, health as only you, O God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing mercy and love, and may your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. And for those who are dying, and for those who have died, send forth your comforting love. Give solace to those who mourn. Console those who grieve. May your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads, a shawl upon our shoulders, and a hand to hold our hand. And may your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong even as we share together the words that Jesus first taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And for our song, Amen, because it just seemed far too fitting, we're going to sing together the Johnny Appleseed song, or Grace. But I know that everybody sings this a little differently, so I'm going to sing the version I know, and then I'll invite you to join with me in singing it a second time. <clears throat> to me and so I thank the Lord for giving me the things I need the sun and the rain and the apple seed the Lord's been good to me Johnny Appleseed Amen 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 Are you ready? Here we go <clears throat> seeds that might seem casual but it's really not it's very intentional and it relates God's work to our work Peter writes as much as received a gift employ it for one another as good stewards of God's varied grace that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ so let us give as people whose work is inextricably linked to God's great works of creation redemption and empowerment and a reminder that we invite you to bring up your gifts of time and writing down the things that you did of service this last week or things you're planning on doing this week, as well as bringing up whatever financial donations you have this morning. So let us be now together in this time and spirit of gratitude. And there are white sheets back there if anybody needs them.
please join with me in our prayer of dedication. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to give to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you not only with our words only, but with our whole lives. Amen. I invite you now to join with me our closing hymn number 532, Come Labor On, and, and Annie already knows that this can become dirge-like, so we're going to try to make it lively. So let us join together in singing our closing hymn. for the week ahead, or depending on where your heart and spirit are, maybe just the day ahead, or even just the hour ahead. Harvest, gardener supreme, you place us at the center, feed us, equip us, and having provided for us, look to a different harvest, a fruitfulness of lives in service to you and others. God of harvest, feed us, prune us, harvest us, that our lives might bring glory to you through your will for us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Peace.